Okay, lecture eight on linear algebra matrices as two by two as matrices as functions, the two by two case. So we will talk about matrix multiplication as a function, null space image, and reduced rare echelon form and determinants. So matrix multiplication as a function. So suppose we want M1 is this matrix, one, two, three, five. What is this function? All right, so here V is the independent variable, independent variable, like x, w is the dependent variable, variable, and that's like y, right? So remember from algebra, wherever you've done this, y equals f of x is a function. Here, v is playing the role of x, w is playing the role of y, and we're actually just multiplying by a matrix, so we don't have an actual f there, we just have what the matrix is. So, a function takes you from a domain to a range by using a rule, so given a vector v, You get an output w by m times v equals w, right? So that's pretty straightforward. So for example, if we start with the vector v equals 2, 1, for example, then m times v equals, well, we take the matrix 1, 2, 3, 5, and you multiply it by the vector 2, 1. And that gives us two plus two is four, three times two is six plus five, that's 11. So what's going on there? Well, a domain is a set of all two by two vectors. And so V is uh, not two by two, just vectors with two entries. So if V is two, here's my vector V over my domain. Multiplication by m takes it to one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Something like that vector, more or less. So this is w equals m times v. So matrix multiplication. takes a, I guess this is M1, takes a vector in two dimensional space over here and you multiply it and you get another vector in two dimensional space over here on the right. This is called the codomain, right? It's where our outputs are. So our inputs are over here on the left, the outputs are over here on the right, um, and the matrix takes us from one to the other. So we can, you know, like you usually do with functions, you can plug in various things. So if V is minus one, one, we can ask ourselves, well, if we have this vector, which is minus one, one, then where does it go? Well, we take one, two, three, five times two, one. And what's that equal to? One times two is, no, sorry, minus one, one. Minus one plus two is one. Minus three plus five is two. So this vector here gets mapped over to one, two, which is sort of in there. And of course, if V is zero, zero, M times V equals, well, zero, zero, right? Because if you multiply anything by zero, you just get zero. So the zero vector is just the origin. And if we take our matrix and we multiply it by the zero vector, we just get the origin again. Okay, so that's not very useful, right? I mean, we can do this, but as we've seen before in this class, doing a lot of point by point plotting is not really a good way to go about thinking about functions. So how can we think about this differently? Well, let's actually define this, right? The domain is the set of inputs that's here. The codomain is the set of outputs that's over there. The set of possible outputs, the image is a set of actual outputs, right? So this vector is in the image because it comes from some vector over there. 
this vector is also in the image because it comes from some vector in the domain. So the domain and the codomain are a set of two dimensional vectors and we call those R2, all vectors of form two entries like that. That's pronounced R2. The symbol there is a little weird. It's an R with two vertical lines there. Not sure where that actually caught on, but that's what it is. So R2. Okay, so we want to think about what the actual function is going on here. And we know that R2 here on the left, this is actually a vector space and it's got a nice, um, it's got a nice uh, basis, a uh, hat and J hat. So, M1 times I hat is our matrix, which is one, two, three, five. And I hat is one, zero. And if you multiply that out, you get one plus two times zero is one, three plus five times zero is three. That's the first column. If you take M2 times J hat, what do you get? You get one, two, three, five. That's our matrix M, sorry, M1 times J hat, zero, one. One times zero plus two times one, that's two. Three times zero plus five times one, that's five. And that's our second column. And that's a nice thing about the matrices one I hat and J hat. When you multiply by matrix, you get the first court, the first column and the second column as your images. So what does that mean? Well, it means we're starting with I hat here and j hat here, then that goes to the vector one, three, that's there, and the vector two, five, which is out a bit like that. So this is m1 times i hat, and that vector is m2, m1 times j hat. Yeah. Great. So that's interesting. It gives us these two vectors. Um, the nice thing about matrix multiplication, though, is that it's something called linear. It actually, um, once you know where i hat and j hat goes, you know where everything else goes. So let's see why that works. So the image, all actual. Um, outputs, right? So the image of a function is all out actual inputs. So if we take a vector here in our domain, we can take i hat and j hat. So we think about structuring two dimensional space, that's our basic points. If we have any vector a, b, right? What is this vector? Well, it's A units in the J direction and the I hat direction, sorry, A units in the I hat direction and B units in the J direction. So if this is some vector V, then we get V equals A times I hat plus B times J hat. So what's the image of any vector over there in the um, domain, well, M1 times V is M1 times A I hat plus B J hat, which is M1 because if we have two matrices, which can just distribute the M1, M1 B J hat equals, and since A is a constant and B is a constant, they can just come out of the multiplication. We have this. But I know what M1 I hat is. That's this vector one three. M1 
And I know what M1J hat is. It's this vector. Uh, what was that vector? Two five. So that's the vector M1J hat. Great. So this vector, you think of it as going A units in the I hat direction and then B units in the J hat direction. What's the image of it? The image of it is A units in the M1 I hat direction plus B units in the M1 J hat direction. So we go A units in this direction. And we go B units in this direction. And we add them together. And so what's M1V? It's that. And this vector has the same relationship to these two as this vector has to these two. So once you know where i hat and j hat goes, you know where everything else goes. And so essential to this is the idea of linearity. If m is a matrix, v and w are vectors, s and t are numbers, then m times s v plus t w is t times m v plus s times m w. So linearity, find m1 times t1. Now remember that, oops, we want to multiply, we want to multiply m1 times the vector 2, 1. And we can write that as m1 times 2 times i hat plus j hat, right? Because the coefficient there is 2 and 1, so it's 2 times i hat plus j hat. And we can rewrite that as 2 times m1 i hat plus m1 j hat. Well, we know what this is. m1 i hat is the first column of m, which is 1, 3. And M1J hat is the second column of M, which is 2, 5. So vector 2, 6 plus vector 2, 5 equals vector 4, 11, which is exactly what we found up here when we just actually did the matrix multiplication. Oh, that's going to work. So M1V is going to be 2 times M1 I hat plus 1 times M1 J hat. So the coefficients that you have of I hat and J hat remain the same, 2 and 1. But now instead of multiplying by I hat and J hat, you multiply by this vector and by that vector. Okay, so this is the results of eccentric field. Yeah, so this is actually the picture just drew up, up above. If you know where I hat go and J hat go, in your domain, and you know where if this is M j hat and this was m i hat then if you have any vector at all we can find these two coordinates a i hat plus b j hat then your new vector is going to be b times this oh, i never leave myself enough space b times m j hat and then a times m i hat, and you add those together to get your parallelogram, and that's m times v. And you can see that these two vectors, m j hat and m i hat, are linearly independent. So every vector in the plane, no matter what a and b you pick, you pick it, you get a vector somewhere. So let's see, domain, codomain. So
because these are literally independent in the codomain. They span the codomain. So image equals all of the codomain. Because, right, any vector here is, any vector in the domain is the linear combination of i hat and j hat. And so any vector in the codomain can be rewritten as a linear combination of these two, of m i hat and m j hat. And then that means it comes from the vector that has the same coefficients back in the domain. So okay, so here's a different function. So we want to think about this function and we want to think about how to illustrate a matrix multiplication. And the goal is not the goal, but the idea is to start with m2i hat, which is going to be the first column like it was above. I'm not going to do the multiplication specifically and m2j hat. And then we know that if v is a vector a times i hat plus b times j hat, then m2 times v will be the same coefficients times m2 i hat times m2 j hat. Keep the coefficients, right? And we just look at the images of m1 of i hat and j hat. So once we know where i hat and j hat go, we know where everything goes. So i hat, j hat. And where do they go? This is our domain. This is our codomain. This is multiplication by M. So M2I is this vector. That's M2I hat. M2J hat is, oh, it's the same ratio just pointing in the other direction. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. So here M1 J hat and M2 J M1 M2 I hat and M2 J hat, these are linearly dependent. So what does that mean for any vector over here in the domain? If I take some vector here, V, that's A I hat plus B J hat, the V is broken up into a vector this way and a vector that way. This vector is A times I hat. That's just gonna get put onto the line out here, A times M2 I hat. B J hat, that's just gonna, that's this vector, that'll just get onto the line down here. What's the sum gonna be? It's gonna be somewhere along this line. So what have we actually happened here is that we've lost a dimension somewhere because our images of i hat and j hat are actually literally dependent. So here, We have a distinction between the image and the codomain, right? The possible outcomes were all of R2. We don't know exactly where they would be. We'd have to calculate that, but that's the possibility, right? We get two dimensional vectors. But the image, right? We ended up not seeing the whole of R2. We just got one line because everything again is controlled where I hat and J hat go and they both went on the same line. So we lost a dimension somewhere because we started with two dimensions and we went to one dimension. So what happened to the other dimension? And that what actually happened is they all got sent down to zero. 
So again, M2 equals, what was that matrix M2? Uh, let's read up. One, three minus two minus six. M2V equals zero, then becomes the matrix equation one, three minus two minus six. And if V is the vector with components A and B equals zero, zero. And we can turn this into equations, right? It's one times A minus two times B equals zero. Three times A minus six times B equals zero. And so the augmented matrix we're looking for is one, three, minus two, minus six, zero, zero. Okay, so you can solve this pretty quickly. We'll take R1 and multiply it by three. We get three minus six, three minus six, zero. And then we'll replace R2 is going to be R2 minus R1. And we will then, after that is done, we will divide R1 back by three just to get our nice numbers back again. Oops. So what's our augmented matrix? Three minus three is zero. Minus six minus minus six is zero. Zero minus zero is zero. And then divide, we get one minus two zero. Okay, so this equation is x1 minus two, oh, actually I'm using a and b here, a minus two b equals zero, or a equals two b. So what is my solution? There's a parameter, how do we handle that? We say, okay, well, we want a, b equal to something. b is gonna be my parameter, so I'll call that t, and then a will be two t. And that's the span of a vector, so it's a subspace. And it's a subspace of the domain, right? Because we're talking about what Bs, that's my domain, when I apply the function to it, I get zero out. Okay, so subspace of the domain. So, great, how can we extend this picture to take into this new information that we have? So, we'll start over in our domain. We'll look over at our range. Um, we'll look over at our codomain. What we know over in the range is any vector that's multiple of two, one, right? And there's the vector two, one. What's its span? That's this entire line. So that line gets sent to zero. So if I think about any vector in the plane now, I can actually think of it as being say a combination of one of this vector and say J hat, right? Those are two linearly independent vectors. They span the whole plane. So I can think of my vector here, if this is a vector V as being something times this vector plus that part. Bad drawing. Something times this vector plus something parallel to J. What if I undo this? I can get my picture back. I'll take my picture back there. Okay, so let's draw that picture again. So this line gets sent to zero. So if we have a vector like this, we can break it up into a part that's along this line out to about here plus a part parallel to J. So this vector, B, has two parts, a part that's parallel to J and a part 
that runs along this line. So where does this image go? Well, we know J hat gets sent to this line, right? J hat gets sent to M2J. So J hat goes down on this line. So this is M2J hat. And this vector, this line, that just gets sent to zero. So when I think about this vector, I can take the part along this line and that just gets canceled out, that just goes away. And this line, that part gets sent down to here. So what's the effect of the matrix? Well, every vector, you can think of it as just being determined by where it's, um, how far it's off from this line, right? So the matrix sends this line, just collapses this line into the origin and then takes the vertical line here and moves it so it becomes that line, right? And so that's one way to think about what a matrix multiplication does. We only have one dimension in our image. So what happens to the other dimension? Well, before, you know, when you do the matrix multiplication, one dimension gets collapsed and then the other dimensions gets shifted over to um, the codomain. So introduce some language here. The image of the function is the set of actual outputs. The codomain is a set of possible outputs. And the image is part of and sometimes all of the codomain. The null space of the function is the set of all solutions to the homogeneous equation. That's this, right? So all the vectors that could map to the zero vector. So this is, in that language, the null space all the vectors that get mapped onto zero. And in a sense, it's a, a, it's a dimension that the matrix multiplication just collapses. So in example four and example seven, you see the image is the span of the columns of the matrix M, right? Because whenever we multiplied by M, M I hat was the first column, M J hat was the second column. Um, and so the image is the span of those two. So it's a subspace of the codomain. The null space is a subspace of the domain. How do you show something's a subspace? Well, m times zero equals zero. If we have two vectors in null space, And the addition of the two is zero because if they're in the null space, then this has to be zero because m times v1 equals zero. That's what it means to be in the null space. And m times v2 is zero. And so how do you check that something's in the null space? You plug it into this equation and show that you get zero out. And so finally, if V1 is in the null space. K a number. Then we want to check is K times V1 in the null space. But multiplication by a constant could come out of that. We know that v1 is in the null space. That means m times v1 equals zero. So that's k times zero, which equals zero. And this is kind of nice because it tells us that the null space is a subspace. So it is a span of some set of vectors. Um, and we can find a basis for it. So that's nice. So we start with two dimensions. Matrix multiplications takes us into the set of two dimensions. If the columns are literally independent, then the two columns will be a basis for the image and you get the entire plane as the image. If the columns are literally dependent, then your image is just going to be one 
dimensional, and then the null space will be the other dimension. So there's an important connection between the dimension of the null space, the dimension of the image, and the dimension of the domain, which is all tied together by the uh, reduced for echelon form. So we've had these two different functions. M1 is this vector and M2 is this vector. So M1 is one, two, three, five. And we can find the reduced row echelon form of this, right? Um, I suppose I should be good about this. R1, replace it with three times R1, and we get three, six, three, five. And then we'll take R2 to be R2 minus R1. And that's three minus three is zero, five minus six is minus one. And then I'll take, since now I've done that, I'll take R1 and I'll divide it by two, no, by three to go back to my nice numbers. So row one now is one, two. Okay, so we will replace row, I'll do this sort of in my head, we'll replace row one with row one plus two times row two. Two times zero plus one is one, two times minus one plus two is zero. Um, and then we will take row two and turn it into minus row two, so we have a nice zero one. So that's the row reduced echelon form of this particular matrix. I'm not too worried about what the actual numbers are on the right hand side. We just know that we get this. So we have two leading ones. And no parameters. If we take M2 and find its reduced row echelon form, that's one, three, minus two, minus six. And then we'll take row one and we'll turn it to three times row one. That makes my matrix three minus six. We actually did this above. This should be three minus six. And then we will take row two and make it row two minus row one. And that gives us zero, zero on the bottom. And then we'll take row one and we'll divide it by three just to get our nice numbers back. So that gives me one and minus two. One leading one. Oops, and one parameter. So what we saw is that the columns of M1 right, is the basis, the columns of M1 span the image, right? And they're literally independent. This particular matrix, the literally independent because right, we got one, one, zero, zero. So, um, number of leading ones equals the dimension of the image, right? Columns of M2 also span the image But the columns are literally dependent, right? And that's why we got a row of zeros down here at the bottom. So we have one leading one, and that's the dimension of the image. We also had one parameter, right? Because if you have only one leading one, then you also have to have a parameter. So, one parameter. And what we saw up here was that, oh, where was it? Oh, I know I showed this up here somewhere. Up here, there it is. Because we got a parameter, that means we actually had a one dimensional subspace for the null space, right? The parameter gives me a vector times the parameter, and that's our null space. 
So the parameter actually gives me the dimension of the null space. So what are we finding here? The columns of a matrix, when you find the reduced row echelon form, each one of the leading ones corresponds to a linearly independent set. If you look at the leading ones, that's a linearly independent set of columns. So M1 has got two linearly independent columns. The images of the columns are, the columns are the basis for the image. So a two-dimensional image, there's no parameters. So nothing is in the, um, you have a zero-dimensional null space because zero, zero is the only solution there. Here, you've got one leading one, and that's, you know, pick this column as a basis for the image. And then you have a parameter, and that's going to tell you that you're going to have a null space. And you have to figure out the dimension of that. You have to figure out what that actually is. So the number of columns, right, that's the size of your domain. And every column is either corresponds to a linearly independent vector or to a parameter, which gives you the null space. Okay, so if you take two vectors, v1 and v2, there are two possibilities for the reduced row echelon form. Um, this or this, where k is just some number. So if the reduced row echelon form is this, then that tells me that these two vectors are linearly independent. That's the columns. Um, the span of the image is has this basis, which is the columns again. And the null space is just the zero vector. So why does that work? So if we have A, B, C, D as our matrix, and remember that the columns are these two vectors, V1 and V2. So if we start with A, B, C, D, and we want to know that these two vectors are literally independent, we set up this augmented matrix. If the reduced row echelon form of this side is 1, 0, 0, 1, then we know the only solution to KV1 plus KV2 equals 0 is 0, 0. So linearly independent. So if we have this as a reduced row echelon form, the columns have to be independent. But the columns are the span of the image. Right, so these are literally independent, and there's two of them, which covers the entire space, and so that's the basis. What's the null space of the function? Well, this actually also calculates for us whether or not there's any vectors whose image is zero. So there's two separate ways to interpret this, right? If we think of this augmented matrix as well, our v1, v2 linearly independent, that means seeing what the solution is to this equation and checking if the only solution is k1 equals zero, k2 equals zero. But since v1 is this vector and v2 is that vector, the augmented matrix you get is that. You can also think of this as which is solving for the null space. And the matrix M is A, B, C, D. We want the outputs to be zero. So you calculate that and see what you get. So if we get one, one as our reduced row echelon form, the columns are linearly independent, which means that the span has V1 and V2 as its um, basis. And the null space is just a zero vector because the only possible solution to this equation is that V is equal to zero. So what happens here? Well, same thing, right? 
RV1, V2 linearly independent. That means solving K1, V1 plus K2, V2 equals zero. Or is there more than one solution to that? But that means looking at the augmented matrix of A, C, B, D, zero, zero. Is there a solution to MV equals zero? Again, that requires looking at this augmented matrix. And if the roots of echelon form is that, we'll get one K zero, 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 zero for both. And we get different interpretations. Here, V1, V2 are not, are actually linearly dependent. And here, there are solutions, well, infinitely many solutions to MV equals zero. And those are described by the parameter. So if they're linearly independent, we know that the span of the image is the span of the vectors, V1 and V2, the columns of the matrix. But if the columns of the matrix are not linearly independent, if they're linearly dependent, you can just pick one of them and that would be the basis. So we'll just go with V1 because that corresponds to the leading one. The null space of the vector, W time equals MV, well, you pick up one parameter. And so that means you'll end up with a one dimensional null space. Okay, so it would be nice if there's a fast way to tell the difference between these two cases. And there is, which is called the determinant. Um, and we wanna be able to tell whether or not our columns are linearly dependent or not just by calculating a number quickly. So determinant of M1 is written like this. So there's a little blurb about that. So it's one times five minus two times three. The important thing is that's not zero. Determinant of M2 is one times minus six minus, and remember that the determinant carries with it a minus sign, minus two times three. So that's going to be minus six, and then minus minus is a plus, plus six, and that equals zero. Great. So M1, where our columns were linearly independent, had a determinant that's not zero, whereas linearly dependent, you had a determinant that is zero. So, and that's true in general. So if these two things are linearly dependent, That means V1 equals, so if linearly dependent, that means V1 equals KV2 for some constant, okay? Um, which means that AC is some constant times B times some constant times D. Now, if we multiply, um, Hang on a second. And so if we turn this into equations, it's A equals K times B, C equals K times D, and that gives me A over C. If I divide top by bottom, equals B over D, or AD equals BC, or finally, AD minus BC equals zero. So if they're linearly dependent, then the determinant equals zero. If the determinant equals zero, right? That means that AD minus BC equals zero or AD equals BC. So if we want to show that they're literally dependent,
we need to find a nonlinear, a non-zero solution for K1 and K2 so that uh, BD equals zero. zero. But let's take K1 equal to A, not A, so K1 equal to D, K2 equal to C. So what's D times AC plus C times BD? That's going to be AD plus uh, K2 equals minus C minus BC and then CD minus CD. Great. So CD minus CD is zero. AD minus BC, if we have our determinant equals zero, that equals zero. Great. So determinant equals zero means that the columns are linearly dependent. Determinant not equals zero means that the columns are linearly independent. And that's this solution, one way of phrasing that solution. Or you can say if the determinant equals zero, that means you're gonna have infinitely many solutions to this equation. You'll have a null space. And if the determinant equals, does not equal zero, then you'll have a null space that consists just of the vector v. Uh, just of the origin zero zero. Uh, 